Hi everyone, I'm here at the seaside, a spot called Bridlington in the UK, really nice coastal site. Sometimes you can be lulled into a false sense of security at the coast because you're flying in sea air, it's smooth, you've got a beach to land on usually. That can make pilots sometimes a little bit complacent and actually flying at the coast has quite a few vices and I'm going to touch on those right now. So at the moment the wind's a bit light, it's also not the best direction, it's still slightly off to the east. And a little tip, uh, something which I mentioned in my last video about ground handling was the use of wind indicators or looking for wind indicators. And at this site at Bridlington we've got a flag over there got a flag on the coast guard over there which are good but probably the best way to judge whether it's flyable is to look at the seagull. Seagulls don't want to waste energy like any animal so if they can soar and save energy from flapping their wings then they're going to do it. Like this pair here that are just flying past, hopefully you can see them, are just about maintaining so maybe it's almost flyable but if the seagulls are flying around and they're all flapping and they're not soaring whatsoever then you can judge that it's probably not flyable. A lot of coastal sites can be quite vertical as in the slope that the uh, creates the lift. So when you're soaring quite a steep ridge the air kind of hits the ridge, goes up and then it'll go pass over the usual launch spot and then kind of tumble behind uh, behind the launch area. You need to bear that in mind when you're taking off there's going to be a dead section right back from the edge so where these benches are and perhaps a couple of meters behind them there's going to be a dead area of air where all the air is hitting the ridge and being forced over that area and it means that it's going to be really difficult to, t to actually launch your wing from that spot. So yeah when you're setting up at the coast look at the grass where the grass on the ground is moving um, that's not in the rotor zone, that's not too far back, that's usually a good spot to set up. So launching at a site like this, you need to have a committed but steady launch, which is, can be quite difficult. So I'm set up here, because the wind is kind of coming in this direction rather than straight southeast, I've lined my wing up to be more into wind. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to have to pull pretty hard on the A's to get the wing off the ground and into a bit of air. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have to have a very committed pull. The wing's not really going to want to come up, but I'm just going to have to keep going, keep going, keep going. And then eventually, once the wing's about halfway up, it's going to hit the air. And what that can result in is being picked up because the wing is going to kind of surge as it hits the air. So I need to prepare for that. And the technique I'm going to use is the A's and B's method. So this is a two-liner. So I'm going to pull, 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 and then I'm going to anticipate the wing getting halfway up and surging and trying to pick me up. And that's where I'm going to use my B's for control. So I'm getting the A's in my right hand. Brakes around my wrists. I'm getting the B's above the wooden handles, like so. Hopefully you can see that. And then I'm just going to move the wing around a little bit. You can see the rotor there is kind of pushing that right hand tip as I look at it. But I can see that my left hand cells are wanting to open. So I'm not going to try and launch, I'm just going to try and sort of fluff the wing up here to open it out. There we go. Pull, 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 surge. And it didn't surge too badly that time. The wind's not too strong today. So all I needed was a little dab on the bees to stop the wing over flying me. And now I'm just on the brakes controlling the wing. Now, as you can see, the wind's a little bit off. And I'm still quite a long way from the edge of the ridge. And today it's not too windy. But on really windy days, the wind is going to be trying to push me back the way I came and stop me from sort of moving forwards. So two things, I need to get my body position really low, so I need my feet out behind me pushing and my chest strap and my chest as low to the ground as possible. 
a bit like you're doing a rugby tackle. And the second thing is I need my hands to be as high as possible so there's little or no break on the wing at all. Any break is going to slow it right down and make it make the job even harder. And if I need inputs, brake inputs, to control the wing, then they need to be as small as possible. So now I'm going to lean forward, adopt the position, and I'm looking for members of the public and benches and the like and dogs. And if I do a nice gradual push, it makes life a lot easier than if I run to the edge leap off into the air what will happen then is I'll just get picked up by the wind and then dumped right back where I started the winds a little bit off to the east which means that I'm currently doing an, an upwind leg and I know once I turn around 180 I'll be doing a downwind leg which is going to be much faster so I need to anticipate that a little thing I like to do when I'm flying on a ridge especially a thermic ridge so not really applicable at the coast is I'm using my brakes to stay close to the ridge, but I'm using my weight shift leaning to the right, away from the ridge. And the reason I'm using that weight shift is to anticipate a collapse on the hillside. So if I get a, a collapse on my left-hand side now, my weight shift is already um, helping me to turn away from the ridge. So now I'm going to turn downwind. My ground speed's going to shoot up. You can see from my shadow down there, it's I'm absolutely flying. I've got a nice big beach to land on here, so if the wind really does pick up and I don't want to land on top because there's likely to be lots of rotor, I've got a nice big beach to land on. But obviously the sea has the tides, so before I came out today I had a quick look online. You can find uh, websites that will tell you what the tide times are. So today, high tide was about 7am. The time now is about, I think, half 10, 11am. So I know that the tide is going out for about another hour or so and then it's going to start coming back in and my landing area i.e the beach is uh, is going to disappear after that time so one of the worst situations that you can get yourself in is if it's super windy at your coastal site and you're flying and if you're stuck in the air and it's super windy and maybe you're pinned or you're using speed bar you can either land on top of the ridge but if it's super windy, the, the rotor zone is going to be big and it's going to be extremely turbulent. So you need to be super careful when you're coming into land, to top land. The other thing, obviously, is the beach. So if you don't have any beach and it's super windy and you're pinned and you don't want to top land, then you don't really have many options. And that is a really bad situation to get yourself in. When you're looking at the forecast for the coast, make sure you're checking whether the wind is due to increase significantly during the day. Another thing to look out for obviously is members of the public and at the coast you're far more likely to bump into people hopefully not literally um, walking along the path like today on the beach and what have you it's going to be far more common than if you're in the middle of the Dales or the Lake District for example where you might see the, the odd fell walker at the coast, it's always busy, especially on nice days. Another hazard on the coast is actually fog, or sometimes it's known as sea fret. And it could come in really quickly and really suddenly. It's happened to me before. I've been flying and you sometimes you can't actually see it coming in until the last minute. And suddenly you get hit by a wall of fog. And visibility goes from, like today, really good, to absolutely non-existent. And that's not a nice situation to be in. It's like being in a cloud on a cross-country flight, but being extremely close to the ground at the same time. It's not a good combination. What you need to do when you're flying is keep checking the sea. Is there any weather coming in? Any fog? Are the, the waves getting bigger? Are the white caps on the waves indicating stronger winds are coming in? The sea is a massive wind indicator that you should check every few minutes while you're flying. Uh, I've got super low on that last turn. The wind's off, it's not very strong, so I'm just getting as close as I can to the ridge. Oh, come on. Oh, there we go. Just get my feet down. So the same rotor that exists 
behind a site like this also needs to be considered when you're coming in for a landing approach. So where I am about now, where I've set up my wing, is ed at the edge of the rotor zone. If I carry on further back here, away from the ridge, to where these signs are, I'm now entering the rotor zone. And this is where you don't want to be when you're coming in to land. Anywhere behind here, to my left-hand side, is just going to be rotor and horrible, and potentially cause a major collapse. So now I'm coming in to land. I'll push out over the sea, lose a bit of height so that I'm coming in fairly low. And I'll come in where these people are walking down the path around there and heading towards this kind of region here. And this is the region where the ridge lift is not going to be picking me up. It's not going to be providing lift. And I'm not in the rotor zone. So all I have to do, even if it's windy, is stay here and eventually I'll come down. It might take a little while, but the temptation to push backwards, push away from the uh, the ridge, is uh, must just be ignored. Don't do that. You're going to head straight into rotor. All you need to do is just stay in this zone and do some gentle S turns if, if possible. <coughs>